Section One of the Pearl Fountain and Other Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annalisa Bodker. The Pearl Fountain and Other Fairy Tales by Bridget and Julia Cavanaugh the pearl fountain a long time ago the fairy queen thought she would go about to see how all the fairies who live in floods rivers streams and fountains were getting on since the last hundred years for it is only once in a century that her majesty can take such a survey of her subjects after travelling a long time scolding some fairies who had got into mischief and praising others who had behaved well the queen came at length to an old old forest which grew on the very top of a rocky mountain and where the trees were so large and the shade was so thick that it was all green within indeed it was so green a place so dark and so cool that people were afraid of it and kept aloof but the fairy queen was afraid of nothing moreover she had particular business in that forest she wanted to see a little fairy who was only three days old and to whom the fountain of the forest had been given by her mother the queen found the little fairy all alone by her fountain it was a beautiful fountain the water was as clear as clear could be it came sparkling out of a rock leaped down other rocks then ran away and hid itself in the moss it looked quite a merry sort of fountain and the little fairy to whom it belonged looked every bit as merry for when the queen came upon her she was dancing in the shade and singing to herself in a sweet clear voice because you see fairies can talk just as they can run about as soon as they are born the queen of the fairies has no children of her own but she is very fond of little children and she always thinks the last baby she sees the prettiest she thought so of this young fairy who was really a pretty creature for she had golden hair blue eyes and rosy cheeks and her mother knowing the queen was coming had dressed her out in a little frock of silver tissue shot with green and blue well my dear graciously said the queen of the fairies to this young thing do you know who i am oh yes answered the little fairy you are her majesty what a clever child you are said the queen quite pleased and who are you please your majesty i am the little fairy of the little fountain my dear you could not have answered me better and now what gift will you have from me my love pearls answered the little fairy then pearls you shall have said the queen as many as ever you can wish for your fountain shall be all pearls and you may do what you like with them but you will have to count them every one i shall like that answered the little fairy for no one must ever take so much as one of my pearls well said the queen if you mean to keep your pearls to yourself you must live here all alone and never go out i shall like that too said the little fairy for i shall sing to myself and play with my pearls and please your majesty may i be called the fairy of the pearl fountain the queen let her have that also then went her way the fairy of the pearl fountain remained in the forest and lived there till she grew up to be the loveliest young fairy that had ever been seen she had a white marble basin made for the water of her fountain to fall into and the most beautiful wild flowers set in the green moss around it 
the water sprang up in a jet from the centre of the basin and the delight of the fairy was to stand in the very middle of it clothed in her robe of silver tissue shot with green and blue for it was not a frock now that she was grown up and to throw the water up ever so high till it reached the sunshine and every drop of water she threw up was a pearl when it came down again a beautiful white pearl some were big pearls and some were little ones and the bottom of the marble basin was covered with them indeed there were so many that the fairy was obliged to let the smallest trickle away every night through a little slit in the basin for if she had not done so it would have overflowed so the pearls slipped away and rolled down the rocks on the mountain side but no one minded them or if some passer-by did see them by chance why he thought he saw drops of water and no more though she had so many pearls the young fairy never thought she had too many and all her delight was to adorn herself with them she strung the largest and the clearest on a thread of gold and mixed it up in her hair and she made a necklace of more and bracelets for her wrists and a waistband and the hem of her silver tissue robe was all studded with pearls and there was not another fairy who had so many she counted them every one as the queen had ordered her and when she laid herself down on the moss at night she still counted them in her sleep indeed she was so fond of her pearls and so jealous of them that she never left her fountain lest any one should come and steal them whilst she was away this lasted a long time till one day the fairy finding that no one ever came near the place and wishing to go and see her sister who lived outside the forest in a crystal turret on a rock and was indeed no less than the fairy of the waterfall put on her best pearls and left her fountain for the first time being a fairy she could go on counting the pearls of the fountain all the same well the fairy was glad to see her sister and pleased to climb up to the very top of the crystal turret and look down at the world below for she had never been out before and she was enjoying herself very much when all of a sudden she cried out i must go i miss a pearl no it is not one but two i declare three pearls are gone what matter about three pearls said her sister have you not got enough but the fairy of the pearl fountain declared there was no misfortune like that of losing one's pearls and went away in a great hurry she missed two more pearls as she walked through the forest for she was not one of those fairies who have only to wish themselves in a place to be in it and on reaching the fountain she looked at once for the thief but she only saw a little wren perched on the edge of the marble basin and catching a drop of the spray in her bill as it fell you little robber cried the fairy in a rage is it you who have been stealing my pearls please ma'am replied the wren quite frightened at seeing her so angry i am only drinking a drop of water a drop of water don't you know you dishonest bird that what was only a drop of water when you drank it would have turned into a beautiful pearl if it had fallen into the basin look down at the bottom and see all these pearls were drops of water once i protest ma'am i knew nothing of the kind answered the little wren speaking very humbly for she had never seen so grand a lady as the fairy of the pearl fountain with her beautiful hair and her pearls i saw water continued the wren i was very thirsty and i made bold to drink surely i thought the good fairy who owns this lovely fountain will never be angry with me for taking a drop of water and i can assure you ma'am 
added the wren dropping the fairy a curtsy that it was the very sweetest water i ever tasted and i do hope you will forgive me the fairy of the pearl fountain had a hasty temper but she was not hard-hearted she looked kindly down on the little wren and said you are a silly bird and i dare say did not know pearls from water i suppose i must forgive you this once but mind you never do such a thing again oh no ma'am never answered the wren very earnestly and please ma'am may i go home to the palace now home to the palace repeated the fairy what do you mean now everyone big or little has a story and the story of the wren was this she had built her nest in the garden of the king's palace and was making herself comfortable there when the young prince found her out caught her and would have killed her if his sister had not come up in time to save her life the princess did more for she took the poor little wren who was frightened to death to her own room and gave her a beautiful cage to live in and keep her out of danger but as the wren is fond of going about she let her have a fly every day and kept a window in her room always open so that she might have no trouble in getting in or out all this the wren told the fairy not in a few words but in a good many for she is a chatterbox if ever there was one and can talk by the hour the fairy however did not mind letting her have her say for she had got into the fountain again and was throwing up the water ever so high and trying to catch the beautiful pearls as they fell back she missed a good many for some rolled down her neck and shoulders and others got in her hair and stayed there and others again slipped through her fingers and fell into the basin oh ma'am how beautiful you are the wren could not help saying and how pretty it is to see you playing with those lovely pearls you have a great deal of sense said the fairy by the way what is your name jenny ma'am answered the wren dropping her another curtsy the princess always calls me jenny never mind the princess said the fairy a little tartly but mind what i say well then jenny suppose that you and i have a game together with my pearls i shall throw them and you shall catch them again and drop them into the basin and when we have done i do not mind letting you have a drop of water to drink you are a very little bird and a little drop of water will do you the wren asked no better than to play with the fairy so the game began the fairy caught the drops of water as they fell and threw them to the wren who caught them in her bill one after another of course then dropped them into the basin the wren was a clever bird and played so well that she only missed three times the fairy was delighted and declared she had never had such fun in short they played till they were both tired when the fairy said there jenny that will do for to-day drink your drop of water and go home to the palace you may come again to-morrow and have another game with me but mind that you tell no one about my pearl fountain may i not tell the princess asked the wren certainly not said the fairy if you do i shall never forgive you besides i am a fairy and i shall find it out and punish you at once the wren promised not to say a word and flew home to her cage in the palace she was afraid lest the princess should ask her where she had been as she often did but she had just been told by her father that he had promised her in marriage to the king of the diamond isles and she was so full of that and of all the diamonds she was to have that she never even saw when the wren flew in through the window the wren made as little noise as she could 
and pecked her supper quietly though she had never been so hungry in her life water may turn into pearls but it is not the thing to satisfy one's appetite well the next day the wren flew to the pearl fountain and the fairy threw pearls at her and the wren caught them in her bill and dropped them into the basin when she was tired she had her drop of water but though she asked to be allowed to bathe in the fountain the fairy would not hear of it and was very cross with her for so much as thinking of such a thing the princess was not in her room when the wren flew back to her cage that day and when she came in the wren had her head under her wing and was fast asleep matters went on so for a good while every day the wren flew to the pearl fountain and played at catching the pearls with the fairy and every evening she flew home to her cage in the room of the princess who was so taken up with her wedding clothes that she never thought of asking her where she had been the fairy became so fond of the wren that she thought she would leave her in charge of the fountain while she went to see her sister again the wren did not like being left alone but the fairy promised not to be long away i shall be back before sunset she said and you may play as much as you like with my pearls and even drink three drops of water and all i want you to do is to stay and watch by the fountain and if any one should come nigh it to call me three times i shall hear you and come at once the wren agreed to this and stayed by the fountain whilst the fairy went to see her sister she played with the pearls till she was tired then she drank three drops of water then she stood on the edge of the basin and thought how nice and cool a bath would be the day was a hot one the fairy was away she will never know anything about it said the wren to herself she spread out her wings fluttered over the water and had the most delightful bath she had ever had in her life she was enjoying herself to her heart's content and had just begun drying herself in the sun when there came a great rushing noise which filled the whole forest it was the king of the fairies driving by but the wren knew nothing about that she was frightened out of her wits indeed she lost her head entirely and instead of calling the fairy as she had promised to do in case of danger she flew home to the palace as fast as ever her wings would take her and never thought herself safe till she lay panting in the bottom of her cage it unluckily happened that the princess was in her room just then trying on her wedding dress why jenny she cried what is the matter with you i was bathing in the forest answered the wren when there came a great noise that frightened me so i flew home see i am not dry yet she shook her wings and a beautiful pearl rolled down on the bottom of the cage i declare that is a pearl said the princess all amazed why jenny where have you been bathing and where did you get that lovely pearl a pearl repeated the wren who did not know what to say yes a pearl said the princess who had picked it up and was looking at it the biggest whitest loveliest pearl i ever saw where did you get it the wren tried not to answer this but the princess insisted upon knowing how she had got the pearl and the wren did not dare to deny her so having first made her promise that she would not mention it again she told her all about the fairy and the pearl fountain when the princess heard about a fountain in which every drop of water became a pearl she nearly went crazy so eager was she to get at it she wanted the wren to take her to it at once but that the wren would not do then she tried to coax her into stealing some of the pearls and bringing them home to her but the wren would not hear of such a thing well at least i shall keep that pearl 
said the princess and the wren who could not take it from her said yes she might when the wren flew to the pearl fountain the next day the fairy gave her an angry look why did you leave my fountain yesterday before i came home she asked i heard a great noise and i got frightened answered the wren why did you not call me asked the fairy i forgot it replied the wren i miss a pearl said the fairy what have you done with it the wren was afraid to say the truth so she answered i was playing with the pearls when one rolled out and fell in the grass and i could not find it again the fairy could have known the truth by looking in her book but she kept it under a stone in the bottom of her basin and there were so many pearls on top of it that she did not like to disturb them well she said to the wren you have behaved very badly and i am very angry with you but if i forgive you this time will you do it again oh no indeed answered the wren so they made it up and had a game and were as happy together as they had ever been as soon as she took the pearl from the wren the princess sent for the court jeweler and gave it to him to set for she meant to wear it on her wedding day the jeweler declared that the pearl was the finest he had ever seen upon which the princess instead of being glad that she had it only thought of all the pearls in the fountain which she had not she lay awake the whole of that night thinking of them still and one thing she was resolved upon when she got up in the morning and that was to find out the pearl fountain and to take some of the fairy's pearls she has so many of them thought the princess that she ought not to mind my having a few then what a fine thing it will be for me to be spoken of as the princess who had so many pearls and who married the king of the diamond isles the wren was in no hurry to meet the fairy that day she took her fly rather late but the princess who had been watching her since the morning followed her at a distance entered the forest after her and stealing behind the trees soon found out the pearl fountain and saw the fairy and the wren playing together at last the wren flew away and the fairy who was tired laid herself down on the moss to sleep the princess waited a while then she stole softly on tiptoe to the edge of the marble basin and holding up both her hands she caught the pearls as fast as they fell when her hands were full she dropped the pearls down on the moss and thought to begin again and have quite a heap of them but the fairy who had been counting them in her sleep all the time now missed them and starting up said angrily who steals my pearls the princess was so frightened that she had not a word to say for herself and the fairy said again in the same angry voice what brought you here i wanted some pearls from the pearl fountain replied the princess and who told you about the pearl fountain asked the fairy the wren told me answered the princess and who are you inquired the fairy i am the king's daughter said the princess and i am going to marry the king of the diamond isles and as your fountain is in my father's kingdom i think you might give me some pearls for a wedding present you shall not have one pearl from my fountain said the fairy i keep all these for myself but go back the way you came and stand at the foot of the rock on your right hand as you leave the forest you will see pearls rolling down its sides these you may pick up they are small and i do not mind letting you have them may i have them all asked the princess every one replied the fairy but mind 
it is only for this once, and though you may stay as long as you please, and take away as many pearls as you can pick up, you need never come again, for not another pearl of mine shall you get. Though the princess thought the fairy very stingy not to let her have a few big pearls, she also thought that little pearls were better than none, so she thanked her and went back the way she had come. She found the rock to her right, just outside the forest, and, sure enough, there were the beautiful pearls rolling down its sides, looking so white and clear in the moonlight. The princess began picking them up as fast as she could. I must have a necklace, she thought, and as the pearls are small, it will take a good many. Then, when she really had enough for a necklace, she wanted some for a tiara. After that, she wanted bracelets, and after bracelets, a waistband like the fairies, then a trimming for her wedding dress, then pearls for rings, earrings, and brooches, then more pearls for double sets of everything, then pearls to give away to her ladies, then pearls for herself to keep. In short, though she spent the night gathering pearls, she had not got half enough by daybreak. She was very tired, but since she could have pearls only this once, she thought it would be the greatest pity in the world to go away without taking as many as she could. So the pearls rolled down the rocks, and the princess picked them up, and the more she had, the more she wished to have. When the king heard that the princess was missing, he was in a sad way. He asked the wren about her, but all the wren knew was that the princess was in her room when she went out to have her fly, and that she was no longer there when she came back. No one else knew anything, and only one thing was certain, that the princess had not spent the night in the palace. The king, her father, was distracted with grief, and the king of the Diamond Isles, who had just arrived in order to marry the princess, lost his appetite at once. He felt in such trouble. The king sent messengers to look for his daughter in every direction. They scoured the country, and found her at length very tired and rather hungry, but still picking up pearls. When they wanted to take her back to the palace, she said it was out of the question, and they were to tell the king that she had still ever so many pearls to gather before she could leave the spot. The king was very much amazed when the messengers came back without the princess and told him where they had found her, what she was doing, and what she had said. Pearls, said the king, and what can she want with pearls when she is going to marry the king of the Diamond Isles tomorrow? I must go and see about all that myself. But when the king went and found the princess and saw all the pearls she had gathered, and those she was gathering still, and when she told him that if she once left the spot she could never have any pearls again, he began to think what a pity it would be not to let her get as many as she could. "'Well, my dear,' he said to his daughter, "'I shall ask the King of the Diamond Isles to wait a day or two, and in the meanwhile you may go on gathering pearls. And suppose that for fear of accidents I should take away these and keep them for you under lock and key. The princess agreed to this. The king took away all the pearls she had picked up, and there was quite a heap of them, and stowed them away in great chests in the palace. He also asked the king of the Diamond Isles, who recovered his appetite directly on learning that the princess was safe, to wait a few days for her. The king of the Diamond Isles grumbled a little, but to please his father-in-law that was to be, he said he would wait seven days for the princess. But when the seven days were out, the princess said she had not yet got pearls enough, and her father persuaded the king of the Diamond Isles to wait seven days more. And so matters went on from one seven days to another, the princess still gathering pearls, and the king her father taking them away and locking them up, and neither thinking they had enough, 
till the king of the diamond isles got tired waiting and went off one morning without so much as ever saying good-bye indeed he went straight off to the queen of emeralds whose daughter he married that afternoon the king was vexed and the princess felt rather sorry but she thought she must only gather more pearls to make up for all the diamonds she had missed so she went on picking them up and when she had a heap her father took it away in a great sack and locked it up till at length all his chests were full and he thought one day he must see how many thousand pearls he had got he unlocked one chest and opened a sack and out came ever so many drops of water that rolled all over the floor my goodness cried the king there's some mistake he opened the next sack out came more drops of water then the next and the next again and all the sacks and all the chests were full of drops of water and in the whole of them there was not so much as one pearl for the pearls were pearls for the princess only and for nobody else when the king saw this and what a mistake he had made he got into such a rage that he had a fit of which he died the next day the princess was very sorry for her father's death but she said the pearls were pearls indeed and she went on gathering them at the foot of the rock there she stands to this day picking them up as fast as she can and never thinking she has enough when the wren flew to the forest again the fairy was ever so angry with her for having told the princess about the pearl fountain but the wren begged so hard for forgiveness and fluttered so prettily about her feet that the fairy said well i shall forgive you once more but lest you should tell tales again you shall stay forever in the forest with me so whilst the princess is gathering pearls at the foot of the rock the fairy and the wren are playing at their game with the pearls of the pearl fountain and no one has ever found out in what forest that fountain is nor on what mountain that forest grows nor in what part of the world that mountain lies end of section one recording by annalisa bodker Section 2 of The Pearl Fountain and Other Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. The Pearl Fountain and Other Fairy Tales by bridget and julia cavanaugh chapter two the silver fish there was a palace once and in the palace there lived a queen who was called the queen of emeralds she had so many of them in front of the palace there was a large pond and the queen thinking what a pity it would be to keep it empty had it stocked with gold and silver fishes every one said how clever that was of the queen and every one was pleased save the frogs who lived in an old well in the garden behind the palace they were very angry indeed that the queen had not put them into the pond what can the queen want with gold and silver fishes said a frog called jumper can they jump in and out of the water as i do besides they are dumb said croaker and i have a lovely voice jumping and singing are all very well said bulrush the oldest of the frogs but what i do not like is that the water goes from our well to feed that pond we shall be left dry some day 
unless I put a stop to it. We wish you would, Bulrush, said all the other frogs. You are so clever, you know. I know I am, answered Bulrush stiffly. Well, don't make a noise, you young frogs. I want to think it over. Bulrush went among the reeds and had a nap there and when he woke he prowled about the well till he found where the water was conveyed from it to the pond along a dark leaden tube bulrush was a bold frog he floated bravely down the great rush of water and never stopped till he came to an iron grating the bars were too close for him to get in through but he peeped between them and saw gold and silver fishes swimming about in the pond he stared at them with his big eyes, till one of the young goldfishes saw him, and tumbled over on his back with fright. "'Idiot!' croaked Bulrush, but he swam back to the well, and as he had to go against the stream, he was very much out of breath by the time he got there. "'Well,' said all the frogs, crowding round him, "'what have you found out, Bulrush?' i have found out that there is nothing uglier than a gold fish answered bulrush unless it be a silver one oh, dear me said the frogs are they so hideous as all that but what about our business when will you begin bulrush begin what he asked crossly begin preventing the water from leaving our well to be sure said jumper indeed sneered bulrush and how would you do that if you please why said jumper i should stop the hole of course and the queen would get it unstopped and turn us all out of the well answered bulrush no jumper that will not do and now don't make a noise i want to think it over upon which bulrush went into the reeds and took a very long nap there some busybody went and told the queen how angry and jealous the frogs were but the queen only laughed and said let them be angry i shall do as i please every day she had a large cake baked for the gold and silver fishes and every morning she went and fed them with her own hand when they saw the queen standing on the edge of the pond with the cake in a basket all the gold and silver fishes swam towards her seven rows deep and one little silver fish the smallest of them swam at their head and kept them in order he hindered the big ones from pushing the little ones about and when the little ones got rude or too frolicsome he would just go and give them such a whisk of his tail that they were glad to dive down and hide their heads for shame the queen was so pleased with this that she said to him one day little silver fish i am going to make you king of the other fishes may it please your majesty said the little silver fish very uneasy i would rather remain as i am besides the other fishes will never acknowledge me as their king but they must said the queen and to show them that you are their king and sovereign i shall give you one of my own emeralds and you shall wear it oh may it please your majesty said the little silver fish more uneasy than ever if the other fishes see me with an emerald and they get none they will hate me and perhaps take it from me but the queen would have her way she bade her jeweler measure the neck of the silver fish and make him a little collar of gold thread with one of her emeralds set in it and when the collar was made she put it herself round the neck of the silver fish and told all the other gold and silver fishes that they were to obey him for now he was their king whatever they thought about this the gold and silver fishes were too much afraid of the queen and too fond of cake to say a word against anything she might do they cried long live silver fish and bobbed before him and matters went on just as they had gone on before the only difference was that the little silver fish wore his gold collar with the emerald at the back for all the other fishes to know him by 
it certainly was the prettiest thing in the world to see him swimming about with that thread of gold round his little neck and the beautiful emerald shining in the water the silver fish had been king a year wanting a day when the queen came one evening to the edge of the pond and said to the fishes i am going away to-morrow morning early i want to see my daughter who is married to the king of the diamond isles as you know but i have left orders to the cook to make and bake your cake every day and to my prime minister to come and feed you every morning with his own hand long live your majesty cried the gold and silver fishes will you be good whilst i am away said the queen oh so good and not push forward and fight for the largest bits oh never and above all things will you obey little silver fish obey him why the gold and silver fishes all protested that they would die for him nay if he liked it they would carry him on their backs so that he need swim no more no need for that said the queen but mind you obey silver fish he is your king and whilst he wears the gold collar with the emerald in it the water will never leave your pond but if any of you should try to take that collar off the pond will run dry in no time with that the queen went away well the cook made and baked the cake every day and the prime minister went and fed the fishes every morning for a week but on the morning of the seventh day after the queen was gone the prime minister instead of getting up early said to his wife i am afraid there is something wrong with our poor queen i really do not see why the queen has set me to feed fishes you are a great deal too clever for it my dear answered his wife well i think i am said the prime minister besides the queen works me so hard when she is at home that i feel i ought to have a holiday now that she is away i want to lie in bed a little in the morning of course you do answered his wife send your page jeremy and do not get up before eleven when the cook saw that it was jeremy and not his master who fed the fishes she thought why should those fishes have cake bread is good enough for them besides i dare say that big boy eats half of it and i am really tired making and baking a cake every day bread they shall have and if they will not eat it why they may leave it accordingly when jeremy came the next morning the cook gave him a loaf of bread and no cake the boy took the loaf to the pond and threw it in in big lumps to the fishes who were there as usual seven rows deep with silver fish at their head i am afraid there is something wrong with our poor queen said silver fish this is bread and not cake still bread is good and we must be glad to get it bread and not cake cried all the fishes we will not touch it we will starve first silver fish tried to argue with them and said that maybe the queen could afford cake no longer and that bread was very good and so on they would not even listen to him but all declared in a breath that they would rather die than eat bread jeremy went back to his master and said please sir the fishes will not eat they made a great hubbub over what i threw to them and the meaning of it all was that they would not eat whilst the queen was away very well said the prime minister who was still half asleep go and tell the cook that the fishes will not eat whilst the queen is away and that she need bake nothing for them till her majesty comes back well when the hour at which the fishes were fed came round the next morning they all swam to the edge of the pond seven rows deep and waited for their cake but no cake did they get i suppose we must eat bread grumbled the older and the wiser ones shaking their heads at the thought but though they waited telling each other of the good old times when fishes had cake every morning and there was no talk of bread neither bread nor cake did there come to them that morning 
When they were tired with waiting, the fishes swam away, and when they got too hungry they swam back, and nibbled at the bread that still floated about the pond. They nibbled so well that only one piece was left, and the biggest of the gold fishes and the biggest of the silver fishes had a set battle over that last piece, whilst the other fishes looked on, and the more daring ones kept darting at it in the hope of getting a few crumbs. Silverfish tried to keep the peace, but no one would mind him. "'Who are you, sir, to dictate to us?' asked the big fellow, giving him a push. "'Yeah, who are you?' said another, swimming up to his very nose, and bobbing his big head up and down at him. Silverfish modestly replied that he was their king, upon which the two big fishes burst out laughing. It was no use reminding them that they had promised the queen to obey him. One fish found out that it would have been all right if Silverfish had been king a year, but as there wanted a day to the year when the queen went away, he could be no king at all. And another fish said quite loud that the best of all reasons for not minding a word Silverfish could say was that if their cake had been stopped, it was because he was in league with the cook. In short, Every fish in the pond quarreled with another fish, and there was only one thing the fishes agreed upon, and it was that Silver Fish had done all the mischief. Hang him, said some. Put him in prison, said others. Don't touch him, said a clever fellow, whilst he wears the queen's emerald. If you do, she will hang us all like so many herrings. This frightened them all. They knew the queen was very strict, and no fish likes to be hung. No one dared to touch silver fish after that. And, indeed, as it was getting late, the fishes gave up quarreling for that day, and went to bed feeling both sulky and hungry. Bulrush, who was very cunning, made no attempt against the gold and silver fishes, whilst the queen of emeralds stayed at home. But he set all the young frogs to gather him fine strong grasses, and when he had had enough of them, he made a large net. This net was just finished when the queen went away, and Bulrush at once set to mischief. He picked up an acquaintance with that same young goldfish whom he had so frightened once, but who was not at all afraid of him now. They met at midnight at the grating when all the other fishes were asleep, and they plotted together against Silver Fish. The young goldfish told Bulrush how their cake first, then their bread had been stopped, how they were starving every fish of them, and how Silver Fish was the cause of it all. And what business has he to be our king? said the young goldfish. He is only silver after all and the only gold about him is that collar which the queen gave him. If you had a bit of spirit, you would take that collar off, said Bulrush. We dare not, replied the young goldfish. It is a gold collar, and it has one of the queen's emeralds, and if we were to take it off, all the water would run out of our pond. Well, said Bulrush, I shall tell you what to do, my friend. Help me to catch silver fish, and I will take him away to a well, and keep him there. You will not hurt him? said the young goldfish. No, no, never, replied Bulrush. And you will not take his collar off? said the young goldfish. Of course not, answered Bulrush. And what shall I have for giving him up to you? asked the trader. "'You shall have the Queen's Emerald,' said Bulrush. "'I was prenticed to a jeweller, and can take it out quite easily.' The bargain was struck, and the next thing was to know how they were to catch silver fish. Well, it was agreed that Bulrush should come with his net to the edge of the pond that very night, and that when he had thrown it into the water, the young goldfish should beguile silver fish into it. They parted very well pleased with each other, for the young goldfish had a silver collar, which was an heirloom in his family, and he thought how he could put the emerald into it, and perhaps be king, 
and bulrush laughed in his sleeve to think what faces the fishes would make when he took off silverfish's collar and all the water ran out of the pond well our time has come at last said bulrush to the other frogs when he got home i have found it all out what have you found out bulrush cried the frogs why there is a silver fish in the pond who wears a collar of gold with the queen's emerald in it and that if we can get this collar off his neck all the water will run out of the pond will it cried the frogs what a good thing and how clever you are bulrush i know i am said bulrush and now listen to me then bulrush told the frogs about his net and how the young goldfish was to drive silverfish into it silverfish said jumper how do you know he is the right one perhaps he is called silverfish because he is gold and not silver i say drag the pond and get all the fishes out yes cried the frogs drag the pond and get all the fishes out the upstarts have been in it long enough hold your tongue said bulrush very sharply let us get silverfish out first then we will drag the pond after that if you like all the frogs now harnessed themselves to the net and dragged it from the well across the garden to the pond in front of the palace bulrush then gave the signal he had agreed upon with the traitor three croaks each a little louder than the last and immediately the young goldfish who was on the watch put his head out of the water it was a clear moonlit night and he saw bulrush and the other frogs all standing in a row on the edge of the pond dear me bulrush he whispered how many of you are there the net is heavy answered bulrush so my friends have helped me to carry it dear me said the young goldfish who began to feel uneasy what a large net to catch only one fish come no nonsense said bulrush where is silver fish i think i would rather not tell you answered the young goldfish diving down he thought to hide in a hole and be safe there but it was too late cast the net cried bulrush in a rage that fish is a traitor jumper who was on the other side of the pond set his frogs to work and bulrush set his and the net was thrown and the pond was dragged and the fishes who woke up in a fright tried to hide and could not and they were all taken out and caught by the frogs and thrown in a heap on the sand and gravel now said jumper with a croaking laugh let us go home and leave these fine fellows there no said bulrush that will never do the queen would know what we have been about and punish us for you know she is very strict we must throw all these fishes back again into the water excepting silver fish he is a little fish with a gold collar and an emerald in it you will know him quite easily bring him to me when you find him i wish to take his collar off with my own hands and to see the water run out of the pond i think too we shall leave silverfish out he will die of course but then the queen will think the other fishes have done it and at all events she cannot give him another collar if he is dead you know the frogs would rather have left all the fishes out of the water and killed every one of them but they were afraid of the queen they did as bulrush told them and began tumbling the fishes about and looking for little silver fish now just fancy what silver fish felt when he heard bulrush he was lying under a heap of other fishes all panting all full of gravel all feeling just ready to die and all thinking that the end of the world had surely come when gold and silver fishes could be so treated some shed tears some begged for mercy some abused the frogs and some called on silver fish to help them but silver fish said never a word he covered himself with earth as well as he could so that he was all black with mud and that you could see nothing of his gold collar 
he got on his back to hide his emerald then he shut his eyes and stiffened himself out as if he were dead and lay quite still all this time the frogs were pulling the poor fishes about looking for silver fish with his gold collar and his emerald and sneering at every fish they handled go and clean yourself my fine fellow they said to one as they threw him back into the water where is your gold they said to another who was all gritty with sand stop said jumper as he saw the young gold fish who had put his silver collar on just ready for the emerald as he thought stop i say do not throw him back if you please a gold fish with a silver collar he is our man no jumper said bulrush we want a silver fish with a gold collar nonsense said jumper they called him silver because he was gold and they said his collar was gold because it was silver jumper i am amazed at you said bulrush do you not see that this fish has got no emerald well i suppose it fell out answered jumper who always would have the last word now whilst bulrush and jumper were arguing the other frogs had thrown back all the gold and silver fishes into the water save little silver fish he was so dirty poor fellow that there was no knowing now whether he was gold or silver not a sign of his collar could the frog see for the mud and as he lay on his back his emerald was hidden the frogs could have seen it if they had turned him over but somehow or other they never thought about that he has no gold collar said a frog he has no emerald said another he is dead said a third let us throw him into his friends since they are so hungry they had better eat him all the frogs laughed and nudged each other and one winked and said don't hurt his feelings with that they tossed silver fish into the water and stood to see him float since that is the way of all dead fishes but silver fish was not dead and he did not float no sooner was he in the water than he became quite lively and swam about to clean himself presently his little silver coat shone as bright as bright could be and lo there was the collar of gold round his neck and the beautiful emerald in it so bright and sparkling for it was such a lovely moonlit night that all the frogs could see it quite plainly well when the frogs saw that the dead fish was a live fish and that he was silver fish with the collar of gold and the emerald in it they were in such a rage as frogs never were in before but the angriest frog of all was bulrush now you idiot he cried shaking his fist at jumper and giving the young goldfish a kick is that silver fish come he added turning to the other frogs let us throw in the net again and catch him yes yes cried the frogs let us catch him the traitor who was alive and pretended to be dead more easily said than done laughed silver fish diving down and indeed it could not be done at all for when the frogs thought to throw their net again they found that the weight of the fishes had made a great big hole in it and that it was worthless bulrush what shall we do with this fish said jumper pointing to the young goldfish let him lie there and die croaked bulrush in his deepest voice bulrush what shall we do with ourselves asked jumper scratching his head go home snarled bulrush and home all the frogs went leaving the young goldfish on the edge of the pond with his silver collar round his neck and now the gold and silver fishes had got a lesson and they begged little silver fish to forgive them he did so willingly but that gave them back neither bread nor cake and they might have starved if the queen had not luckily come home in time to set matters right when she went to the pond she found the young goldfish lying there in a dying state though much exhausted he could still speak and had breath enough to tell the queen of his treason and of the misdeeds of bulrush and the frogs the queen turned out her prime minister at once for having been too fond of lying in bed gave the cook warning for not having obeyed her orders and had the well stopped up 
so that the frogs could never get out again and make mischief. Bulrush died with spite, but Silverfish was king all the days of his life. End of section two. Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section three of The Pearl Fountain and Other Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. The Pearl Fountain and Other Fairy Tales by Bridget and Julia Cavanaugh. The Golden Hen. The Golden Hen lived in Fairyland with the Silver Peacock and the famous Blue Bird, whom everyone has heard of. These two had been in the world, but the Golden Hen had never left home. She got tired of living in Fairyland all the days of her life, and one day she said to her friends, I, too, must go out into the world. I find it dull to awaken in Fairyland, to eat in Fairyland, and to sleep in Fairyland. I must have a change. Take care, said the Silver Peacock. I went into the world, and I repented it. And you know, put in the Bluebird, that if you do go, you cannot come back for a year and a day. But the Golden Hen would not be advised. She flew away out of Fairyland, and flew and flew, till she came to the world at last. It was a long journey, and the Golden Hen felt very tired when she alighted upon a cornstack. She was very hungry, too, and began to peck at the corn. Some hens from a neighboring farm had been let out into the field, and the Golden Hen, who liked company, thought she would join them. After a while, she flew down and pecked with the other hens, and as no one seemed to mind her, she went home with them in the evening. When the farmer's wife came out with her apron full of corn to feed the fowls, she saw this beautiful hen and wondered where she came from. But she did not drive her away, for she thought, she has got astray, but I shall keep her. She is a wonderful creature, and shines like real gold. So the golden hen roosted with the other hens that night, and went out with them the next morning. Fairy birds never lose their feathers in fairyland, but when they leave it and choose to travel, they fare just like other birds. As the farmer's wife was looking for new laid eggs the next morning, she saw three yellow feathers that shone and glittered like gold, lying in the straw. She picked them up and found that they were gold indeed, and so fine and so pure that she had never seen any to compare with it. Now this woman was a great miser. She threw down her eggs for fear the golden hen should escape. She ran after her, caught her, and began plucking her as fast as she could, and as much as she dared without killing her outright. The golden hen screamed and struggled, but it did not help her a bit. The farmer's wife would not let her go, till she was all torn and bleeding. Ah, oh, thought the golden hen, I wish I had minded the advice of the silver peacock, for what is to become of me, if, as the bluebird says, I must remain a year and a day in a world where I have already been used so ill. After a while, however, the golden hen began to think that everyone might not be so cruel to her as the farmer's wife had been, and that she might fare better if she went farther. So whilst the other hens were pecking in the stubble, she slipped away into a little wood hard by, and hid there, and at night, instead of going back to the farm, she went up to roost alone in a tree where she remained nearly the whole of the next day. The farmer's wife came to seek for her in the morning, threw corn about, and called her ever so coaxingly. 
but the golden hen was not to be caught again she stayed safely hidden till her enemy had long been gone then she came down and pecked a little corn and flew up again on the least noise the farmer's wife came again to the wood the next day and the golden hen up in her tree thought ah well i shall be caught this time but she need not have been so frightened the woman only picked up the corn which she had scattered and neither called the golden hen nor tried to find her for on looking that morning at the feathers which she had plucked from her she had found that three only and they were not large ones were gold whilst the others were common yellow quills when the golden hen sheds her feathers they are real gold but when anyone robs her of them they are just yellow feathers and no more the corn being gone the golden hen was nearly starved that day she also felt rather dull for she had always been used to company i cannot bear this life any longer she thought i must eat and i must have society she left the wood at once and went pecking on the way until in the evening she came to a large farm twice as large as the first there were more hens than you could count in the yard of that farm and the golden hen peeping in at them through the bars of the wooden gate thought to herself there are so many hens here that if i can once get in amongst them no one will ever find me out she waited till the hen-wife's back was turned then slipped in unseen the other hens seeing how ill she was were kind to her they let her in amongst them allowed her to feed and roost with them that night and to go out with them the next morning for six days the golden hen remained on the farm and no one save the other hens was the wiser for it but on the morning of the seventh day as the farmer watched the hen-wife counting the eggs he overheard a little white hen saying and so you really are the golden hen and your feathers are real gold well to be sure how wonderful hush said a black hen the master is there and you know he understands all we say unfortunately for the golden hen this was too true the farmer had both heard and understood what the little white hen said and on learning that the golden hen was actually on his farm he had all the gates and doors shut and the hens driven into a corner of the yard he soon spied out the golden hen though she tried hard to hide behind the others and having caught her he carried her to a room upstairs where he began plucking her some one has been at you before me said he as he pulled out her quills but if you escaped once my pretty hen i shall take care that you do not escape again when he had plucked the poor hen almost bare he locked her up in the room and put the key of the door in his pocket this farmer had a servant lad called robin who was both inquisitive and cunning he had seen his master catch the golden hen take her upstairs and come down again without her it so happened that robin had a rusty old key that opened the door of the room in which the hen was locked up as soon as the master's back was turned he crept upstairs opened the door and peeped in in a moment the golden hen slipped out between his legs and flew away through an open window robin could have caught her again but if he had tried to do so his master would have found out all about the key he therefore locked the door crept downstairs very softly and let the golden hen get off she made her way out of the farm through a hole in the hedge and was far away when the farmer came in to feed her he was as mad as mad could be on finding that she had escaped but it was some comfort to him to remember all the golden feathers he had taken from her he went to look at them at once and instead of a heap of treasure he found ever so many yellow quills that were worth nothing at all the golden hen had enough of the world by this and would have given anything to go back again to fairyland but as she could not do so 
till the year and the day were out all she thought of was to get away from farms and farmers and farmers wives she crept for a while along the hedge through which she had escaped then seeing that no one was by she got into a green field where a cow was grazing and from that again to other fields till she came to one where two little boys were gleaning the golden hen kept in the furrows so they should not see her and stayed hiding there till it was evening time and the children were gone these two boys were the orphan grandchildren of a poor old widow who lived hard by and early the next morning they came to glean again at noon they sat down under a hedge and began to eat some dry bread each had a piece a very little one for their grandmother was poor and could give them no more the golden hen who was hiding close by peeped at them through the hedge and listened to every word they were saying they were talking about the little sheaf of corn they had gleaned and rejoicing over it they knew how glad their grandmother would be to get it and they also hoped that she would make them a cake with the flour they are very poor thought the golden hen i fear they will not give me any of their corn and they have so gleaned that there is none left but then they are also very little i scarcely think they will hurt me and if they attempt it i can hide from them she came out of the hedge and showed herself to the two children but prudently kept at a little distance oh what a pretty hen cried the younger boy oh the poor hen said the elder one see how torn and bare she is he threw her a piece of bread but it was too near and the golden hen who was getting mistrustful did not dare to come and take it he then threw her another piece farther away and this she ate greedily for she was starving then the younger boy took an ear of corn and shelling it in his hand he scattered the grains and the golden hen getting bolder as she saw how kind the children were drew near and pecked it before them so they fed her till they had eaten all their bread and then they went away to glean in other fields the golden hen followed them at a distance and picked up a little corn on her way when evening came the boys went home and the golden hen hid in a hedge and stayed there all night the two boys came to glean again the next morning and as soon as she saw them the golden hen joined them they gave her some of their bread again at noon and this time she ate it quite tamely pecking it out of their hands and when they went home that evening the golden hen followed them when the grandmother of the two boys saw the state the poor little hen was in she was very sorry for her she gave her corn to eat and water to drink and she stroked her softly and having washed the clots of blood from her feathers she gently rubbed her with a little butter and as it was night now and she knew that the hen would want to roost she settled a perch for her in a corner of the cottage ah well thought the golden hen as she flew up on the perch and roosted i have met with kind people at last poor though the old woman was she would not turn out the little hen but kept her for charity's sake i shall not miss the creature's corn she said besides how can i let her wander about and ask for a home she is so ill poor thing that no one would have her i see that i have found a home thought the golden hen who heard her i shall stay here till the year and the day are out and then i can go back to fairyland the golden hen took a long time to get well but at length her pretty feathers all came back and she shone so that the old woman and her two grandchildren declared there had never been a bird like this she was a great pet with them and never went out for fear of falling into evil hands she did not get much to eat for they were very poor but she knew they did their best and never grumbled 
she had been three weeks with them when the younger boy found one of her feathers in the little yard where she used to peck alone he showed it to his brother who found another feather the next day their grandmother not knowing that these feathers were gold left them to the children to play with it so happened that as the two brothers were playing with their feathers one afternoon a peddler looked over the hedge and saw them he pushed the little wicket door open and called out to the old woman to come and see his wares but he was looking at the golden feathers all the time i can buy nothing said the old woman coming out and wiping her hands in her apron for she had been washing i want nothing just now besides i have no money the peddler pressed her to no purpose then after a while he said let me have these little yellow things that your boys are playing with and i will give them some pretty toys instead as the boys asked no better their grandmother consented to the exchange to one the peddler gave a drum and to the other a horse and car for the two feathers have you got any more of them he asked as he put them by the widow had saved up the feathers dropped by the golden hen she did not know their value but she thought them pretty she replied that she had seven more and as the peddler asked to see them she went and fetched them at once he was so anxious to get them that he offered her a gown for herself and a cap for each of the boys in exchange for the seven feathers she gladly agreed to this and was as pleased with her bargain as the peddler was with his from that day forth the widow and her grandchildren saved up the feathers of the golden hen very carefully and they had quite a heap of them by the time the peddler came again this time they all got an outfit for the winter and a little money besides for the roof of their cottage wanted mending sadly perhaps the golden hen did it on purpose but she certainly dropped so many feathers about this time that it was quite amazing and the next time the peddler came the widow would take nothing but money in exchange for her little treasure with that money she bought a cow and rented some land and hired a stout servant boy to till it and still the golden hen dropped her feathers and the peddler came and bought them and paid dearer for them every time he came for the widow as she wanted money less raised her terms and sold her feathers dearer and dearer well to make a long story short by the time summer came round again the widow was a prosperous woman and had begun to build a house and she had two cows and a horse now and hens and geese and turkey cocks but none of these were allowed to interfere with the golden hen who still had her perch in the corner of the cottage and roosted there alone every night the year and a day had been out a week the golden hen was now free to fly back to fairyland but she liked her friends so well that she could not make up her mind to leave them i shall go to-morrow she used to say to herself but when the morrow came she put it off for the next day again and so a whole week went by and she could not find it in her heart to go they want some of my feathers still thought the good little hen i shall leave them when the house is built now as the widow and her two grandsons were eating their dinner one hot summer's noon the peddler suddenly looked in at them through the open window good day to you ma'am says he good day master answered the widow i have got more feathers for you if you want them my good woman i do not want feathers i want your bird my bird yes your hen i want her and you must sell her to me the widow and the two boys cried out in a breath that the hen was not to be sold well it is no use hiding or mincing the matter said the peddler but the fact is that the goldsmith to whom i sold the feathers sold them to the queen who made a necklace of them then a crown and who now wants the bird so just name your price 
the widow declared that nothing could tempt her to sell the golden hen but the peddler assured her that the queen was bent on having her and again bade her name her price if the queen will take my hen from me i cannot prevent her said the poor widow crying but nothing shall ever make me sell my dear little hen the peddler went away much displeased and the widow and her two grandsons could eat no dinner they were in such trouble they could think and speak of nothing but the queen and their hen and they talked the matter over that same evening whilst the hen was roosting grandmother said the elder of the two boys let us put the hen in a basket and go away with her so far so far that the queen cannot overtake us no said his brother let us stay at home and give the queen a feather a day if she will only leave us our little hen the poor grandmother shook her head at all of this she knew there was no bribing a queen and no running away from her she also knew that queens will have their own way and she sadly feared that the golden hen must be given up to her majesty well they heard no more of the peddler he did not come the next day nor the next again and on the third day the widow and her two grandsons were beginning to take heart and to hope for the best when the younger boy cried mother i hear a great beating of drums and mother said the elder one i hear a great galloping of horses ah said the grandmother the queen is coming for my golden hen and so she was the queen herself was coming to take the golden hen away presently the drums left off beating and the tramp of the horses ceased and a gilt carriage drawn by eight milk-white steeds stopped at the widow's door whilst the queen herself alighted she was dressed in blue satin and had a gold necklace round her neck and a gold crown on her head and both were made out of the feathers of the golden hen my good woman said the queen looking very grand i hear that you have got the golden hen and i have come for her where is she may it please your majesty answered the widow dropping the queen a curtsy i cannot part with my hen the children will break their hearts if they lose her now do not there is a good soul and do not go on with such nonsense said the queen but just let me see that hen of yours even as she said the words the golden hen who was in the yard all the time flew up into an apple tree and began flapping her wings so that a shower of golden feathers fell down on the grass below now that is beautiful cried the queen clapping her hands she was so pleased i shall die unless i get that hen page go and catch her directly page did as he was bid and began climbing up the apple tree where the golden hen was flapping her wings and shedding her feathers all the time but just as he stretched out his hand to seize her the golden hen flew away high up into the air for the queen and all the courtiers saw her soaring and shining like a speck of gold in the light of the sun until she vanished entirely the queen was so vexed at not getting the hen that she stepped back into her carriage and rode away without saying a word and when the drums began to beat she made a sign with her hand that they should not when the widow and her grandsons were alone they picked up the feathers which the good little hen had shed and there was quite a heap of them the two boys were ever so glad that their hen had escaped from the queen and made sure that she would come back to them in time but their grandmother guessed from all the feathers she had dropped before going that the golden hen did not mean to return and she never did on leaving the apple tree she flew away straight to fairyland where she remained ever since the boys were very sorry for the loss of the golden hen but they were comforted in time and thanks to her parting gift 
for the queen bought all the feathers and paid handsomely for them they were rich farmers when they grew up end of section three recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida Section 4 of The Pearl Fountain and Other Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Lee. The Pearl Fountain and Other Fairy Tales by Bridget and Julia Cavanaugh. Sunbeam and Her White Rabbit. Sunbeam was so called because she had golden hair that flowed round her face and made it as bright as the sun on a summer morning. No one could see her and not feel glad, and when she went to the village on an errand for her father and mother, who lived a little way off, everyone welcomed her, and it was, "'Good morning to you, Sunbeam. How are you, Sunbeam? Or, I am so glad to see you, Sunbeam. And yet, Sunbeam was only a poor man's child.' Her parents lived in a little cottage in a wild waste place, almost surrounded by rocks. Sunbeam was fond of climbing up there, and as she sat amongst the wild flowers, she liked to watch the bees looking for honey. She was not afraid of them, and they knew her quite well, and liked to see her there. Sunbeam was sitting thus one day, with the bees around her, when a big bee said to her, "'Would you not like to stay with us, Sunbeam?' It is very pleasant up here with the wild thyme and the bluebells and all that. Yes, it must be nice, replied Sunbeam, but you see I must go home to father and mother. Well, I suppose you must, said the bee, after considering a while. I don't remember my father myself, but I was very fond of my mother, as nice an old bee as ever you saw, Sunbeam, and the best mother in the world. But as I said, it is very pleasant up here, and we have a very good hive in that old oak, and plenty of honey in it, I can tell you. Yes, it must be pleasant in the old oak tree, answered Sunbeam, but then how could I get in? I am afraid you are too large, answered the bee, after looking at Sunbeam. Well, never mind, my dear, it is no sin to be big, and we like you all the same. Thank you, said Sunbeam, but what noise is that which I hear below? Oh, that is the giant hunting. He is a dreadful man. He spoils all our flowers with his hounds and horses. I cannot endure the sight of him. So saying, the bee flew away in a pet. Sunbeam looked down in the plain below her and watched the giant riding by on his big black horse. He looked so terrible and he was so tall that Sunbeam felt quite afraid of him and hid low among the rocks lest he should see her. But he did not, for the giant, the huntsman, and the hounds were all pursuing a poor grey rabbit and her young one, who was white as milk. The grey rabbit flew across the plain and was caught and killed, but the little white rabbit climbed up the rocks and jumped right into Sunbeam's lap. She took him in her arms and ran home with him, and the giant, the huntsman, and the hounds were so glad to have caught the grey rabbit that they never missed the white one. Sunbeam was very fond of her white rabbit. She made him a bed of moss and fern, and worked him a pretty red collar and a pair of red garters, which she put on him every morning. She took him with her whenever she went to sit among the bees in the rocks. Indeed, the bees and the white rabbit became very good friends. They did not mind his skipping about, and kindly gave him up the wild thyme to nibble when they had sucked and done with it. When Sunbeam went to the village, the white rabbit followed her, walking very nicely on his hind legs, and Sunbeam and her white rabbit became a byword, for you never saw the one without also seeing the other. So sure as Sunbeam appeared with her golden hair, so sure the white rabbit was behind her. Now it so happened that the giant, who was getting old, could not go out hunting any more, and fell into very low spirits. He had heard of Sunbeam and her white rabbit, and he thought he would like to have her. "'I find that this castle of mine is getting very dark,' he said to his wife. "'Go and fetch me Sunbeam. I am sure she will make it quite bright again with her golden hair. 
I shall also like to put my hands through it, and see if it is cold. Besides, she has got a white rabbit, who will skip about the room and make me laugh, for I have heard that he walks on his hind legs, and he can dance, I dare say, and when I am tired of him I can have him dished up for my supper. The giant's wife was a good woman, but she was mortally afraid of her husband, and would not have disobeyed him for the world. She went at once to the little cottage in which Sunbeam's parents lived, and she said to them quite politely, for she was a very civil lady, "'If you please, where is Sunbeam?' "'May it please your ladyship, Sunbeam is out,' answered Sunbeam's father. "'Ah, well,' said the giant's wife, "'send her round to me as soon as she comes home. My husband finds that his castle is getting very dark, and he is sure Sunbeam will make it quite bright again with her golden hair. He will also like to put his hands through it and see if it is gold. Besides, Sunbeam has got a white rabbit, who will skip about the room and make him laugh, for he has heard that he walks on his hind legs, and he can dance, I dare say. But the giant's wife said nothing about having the white rabbit dished up for the giant's supper. The parents of Sunbeam were in sad distress at having to give her up to the giant, but they did not dare to say no. They knew besides that it would be of no use, for if the giant had set his mind on having Sunbeam, why have her he would. They promised to send her up to the castle when she came home, and on that promise the giant's wife left them. When Sunbeam came home that evening, her mother had not the heart to send her to the castle. "'Let us keep her this one night more,' she said to her husband, and he answered, "'Yes, let us keep her this one night more.' "'Sunbeam,' said her mother to her, "'you must get up early tomorrow. The giant is ill, and you will have to take some new-laid eggs to the castle.' "'Very well, mother,' answered Sunbeam. She did not mind going to the castle if the giant was ill, for she made sure that she should not see him. Sunbeam slept in a little cot, and the white rabbit's bed of moss and fern was close to it. They both went to bed as usual, and Sunbeam soon fell fast asleep, but the white rabbit did not. Towards midnight, when everything was very quiet in the cottage, he got up on Sunbeam's bed and gently scratched her face with his paw. Sunbeam woke at once, and saw him in the moonlight, which was shining brightly through the window. Well, said Sunbeam, what is it? Are you thirsty? Shall I give you a drink? I am not thirsty, thank you, answered the white rabbit. But don't talk so loud, Sunbeam, for I have got something to tell you. If you take new-laid eggs to the giant's castle tomorrow, the giant will keep you. He finds his castle getting very dark, and he is sure you will make it quite bright again with your golden hair. He will also like to put his hands through it and see if it is gold. He wants me to skip about the room and make him laugh, for he has heard that I can walk on my hind legs, and he fancies I can dance, and when he is tired of me, he can have me dished up for his supper. For the white rabbit could not merely talk, he also knew everything. Oh, what shall we do? said poor Sunbeam, who began to cry. I shall die with fright if the giant puts his hands through my hair to see if it is gold, and I shall break my heart if he has you dished up for his supper. Don't cry, Sunbeam, said the white rabbit, but do as I bid you. Get up as soon as it is dawn, and open the door as softly as you can. We will go to the rocks and hide there, and take my word for it, the giant shall not find us. Sunbeam did as the white rabbit told her. She got up as soon as it was dawn, dressed herself, put the white rabbit's red collar and garters upon him, and opened the door as softly as she could. Neither Sunbeam's father nor her mother heard her, and Sunbeam and the white rabbit went up to the rocks together, and hid there with the bees. Sunbeam told them her trouble, and asked them to hide her and the white rabbit, but the big bee answered, We would hide you if we could, Sunbeam, for we like you but you are too large to get into our hive in the oak, you know. That is very true, said poor Sunbeam, crying. I wish I were not so big. Don't cry, Sunbeam, said the white rabbit. It will all end well, take my word for it. Well, when the father and mother of Sunbeam awoke, and found that Sunbeam and her white rabbit were gone, 
they were in sad trouble, for they thought how angry the giant would be. And he was in a fine way indeed, and sent all his dogs and all his men to fetch Sunbeam. Mind you bring me back Sunbeam, growled the giant as he sent them, and her white rabbit as well. I want to hang him with one of his own red garters. Neither the dogs nor the men could find Sunbeam and her white rabbit at the cottage. They are with the bees, said one man. Let us go and look for them up in the rocks. Now when Sunbeam heard the dogs and saw the men coming for her, she wrung her hands and cried bitterly. Oh, what shall I do if they get me? sobbed poor Sunbeam. I would rather be that bee than go to that wicked giant's castle and have him putting his hands through my hair to see if it was gold. Would you? said the white rabbit. And what should I be then? Why, you could be that pretty little ant close by. Well, the dogs now smelt the white rabbit and began to bark, and the men saw Sunbeam and cried out to one another, There she is. We have got her. But when they came up to the spot where Sunbeam had been, the child was gone, and all they saw was a little golden bee humming above the wild thyme. "'I'll kill that bee,' said one of the men in a rage, but just as he was going to fling his cap at the poor little bee, an ant stung his foot, so that he screamed with pain. Up and down among the rocks went the dogs and the men, but neither Sunbeam nor her white rabbit did they find, and the giant had to do without them. The father and mother of Sunbeam were very glad that she had escaped, but they wondered what had become of her. They were afraid she was hungry, and they went and looked for her among the rocks with some bread and milk in a basket, which Sunbeam's mother carried, but no Sunbeam with her white rabbit did they see, and when they called her, no answer did they get. Then Sunbeam's mother began to cry. I am afraid our little Sunbeam is lost, said she. I am afraid she is, answered her husband. Yet let us hope, wife. The white rabbit is very clever. He will take care of her. When they were tired looking, they went home and went to bed, for it was night, and each dreamed of Sunbeam that night. Wife, said Sunbeam's father, when he woke the next morning, I dreamed that I saw our Sunbeam among the rocks, sucking the wild flowers, and the white rabbit was with her. Yes, said his wife, and she was saying, I wish I had some honeysuckle, and the white rabbit answered, Tell your father to get you some. Then I will, said Sunbeam's father. He took some honeysuckle from his little garden, and set it among the rocks, and the next night both he and his wife dreamed of Sunbeam, and they saw her sucking the honeysuckle, and laughing, and looking as bright as ever. Well, days, weeks, and months passed, and nothing was seen or heard of Sunbeam. Her father and her mother dreamed of her every night, and she looked so happy that they became comforted, the more so that the giant was always sending his wife to know if Sunbeam had come back because he found his castle getting darker and darker, and he wanted Sunbeam more than ever. "'Better to have our Sunbeam anywhere than with the giant,' said Sunbeam's father. "'Aye, better indeed,' said his wife. They both died when Sunbeam had been gone seven years. The giant's wife died too, and the giant, who was more wicked than ever, was left alone with his grandson the prince. He was called the prince because his mother had been a princess. He was a very handsome young man, rather tall, but not a giant, and as good as his grandfather was wicked. The giant, not having been able to get Sunbeam with her golden hair, had got together all the gold he could lay his hands on instead. But though he had so much gold that his castle was almost full, he found it getting darker and darker every day. I have not gold enough said the giant, but how am I to get more? I am too old to fight now, and the giantess, who has twice as much gold as I have, would not marry me. Perhaps she would marry Prince, and come and live here, and bring all her gold with her. 
the giant went and asked the giantess who was his fifth cousin if she would marry his grandson and bring her gold with her the giantess lived in a castle hard by and received her cousin very kindly she agreed to marry prince though she found him rather short but then said she we can put him upon stilts and you will bring all your gold said the giant to be sure i will replied the giantess and tell prince to get a pair of stilts and practice walking with them so that he may be quite steady on the wedding day the giant went home and asked for prince but the young man was out where is he growled the giant may it please your giant ship answered one of his men prince is up in the rocks prince goes there every day does he said the giant with a big frown well tell him to come and speak to me as soon as he comes in prince was up in the rocks as the man had told the giant he liked nothing so well as being there for as he sat resting there one day he had amused himself with watching a little yellow bee as bright as gold and very pretty that went about humming among the flowers and what struck prince much was that wherever the bee went a little brown ant followed and went too when he came again to the rocks a few days after this prince saw the golden bee and its little brown ant again and indeed day after day he saw these two and they knew him as well as he knew them one morning the bee was humming around his head when prince said to it come on my hand bee immediately the little golden bee alighted on his finger whilst the ant stood still under a blade of grass and waited prince was very much pleased to see the bee so friendly i wish you could talk bee he said and tell me what i could do to please you but the bee only gave a little hum and after a while flew away immediately the ant moved on and soon the two were gone now this happened the very same day on which the giant went to see the giantess where have you been growled the giant as soon as the prince came in i have been to the rocks answered prince well then you will not go there to-morrow growled the giant again you will have to go and court the giantess whom you are going to marry and mind you get a nice pair of stilts in order not to be too short for her marry the giantess cried prince in a rage at the thought never and i say you shall marry her growled the giant he was always growling since he had lost his teeth but why should i marry her asked prince because she has ever so much gold and that i want gold answered the giant gold is yellow and i like it and i saw a yellow bee to-day in the rocks answered prince it was as yellow as gold and i like it a bee sneered the giant perhaps you want to marry that bee i would rather marry her any day than the giantess answered prince quite angry a bee is it cried the giant in a passion well then you shall marry that bee and sunbeam's white rabbit shall be your bridesman what put sunbeam's white rabbit into his head just then was more than any one could imagine perhaps it was because prince had come from the rocks where sunbeam and her white rabbit had been so fond of going formerly marry the pretty little bee i saw to-day answered prince laughing well i ask no better and i shall be glad to see a white rabbit the giant stamped his foot and shook his fist but prince would not marry the giantess they were a stubborn family and the long and the short of it was that the giant said prince should marry the bee and that prince answered he asked no better in order to scorn his grandson the more the giant had a day appointed for the wedding of prince and the bee he sent out a great many invitations and they were all accepted for every one wanted to see a bee married the giantess however was too much affronted to come though she only pretended to laugh and asked if prince meant to wear the bee in his bonnet the giant also had presents prepared for the bride a gold crown and necklace 
and wedding clothes made for a good-sized bee. The wedding dress was gold brocade, as stiff as stiff could be. The marriage was to take place up in the rocks, and there, on the wedding morning, the giant went with Prince, who looked very handsome in white satin, and forty fiddlers walked behind them, all playing, and as many lords and ladies as could be got together, and all so beautifully dressed that every one agreed there had never been a wedding so grand as was this. Prince walked first, and as soon as he got up in the rocks, the little golden bee came towards him, and lit on his finger. "'Oh, that is the bee, is it?' said the giant. "'Yes,' answered Prince. "'That is the bee.' "'And what white rabbit is that behind you?' asked the giant. The prince turned round and saw a white rabbit in a gold collar and garters. "'That is my bridesman,' he answered. "'Well, then,' said the giant, "'will you marry that bee?' "'Yes,' answered Prince. "'I will.' "'And you, bee, will you marry Prince?' asked the giant. "'Yes,' answered the bee. "'I will.' And scarcely were the words spoken when Sunbeam appeared before them in the stiff gold brocade dress and with the gold necklace and the crown of gold and her beautiful sunny hair. Everyone was amazed and everyone was glad. The forty fiddlers began to play, and Prince took Sunbeam straight home to the castle, with the white rabbit walking on his hind legs behind them, and a swarm of bees went with them as far as the castle gate, but would not go in for fear of accidents, though Sunbeam, who was grateful for the kindness they had shown her so long, pressed them ever so much. "'Thank you, Sunbeam,' said the big bee. "'But our oak tree was too small for you formerly, and your castle is too large for us now. So good-bye, and come and see us.' With which the big bee flew away with all the other bees after her. The giant was so pleased to have Sunbeam at last, that he declared he did not care for the giantess and her gold now that he had Sunbeam and her golden hair. Sunbeam agreed to let him look at it as much as he liked, provided he did not put his hands through it. The giant promised that he never would, but made it a condition that the white rabbit should wear his gold collar and garters and dance for him every evening. This the white rabbit agreed to, but he made it a condition that the giant should never have him dished up for supper. When all this was settled, the wedding went on quite merrily, and everyone was as good and as happy as everyone could be for ever after, especially Prince and Sunbeam, and Sunbeam never forgot how kind the bees had been to her, but often went to see them with her white rabbit behind her. End of section 4